today we're going into a message that's got a very strange title, and that is, What is Hidden in the Reeds? Now, normally we think uh, those that may uh, uh, think of it from the biblical standpoint, we think of Yam Suf, or the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea in which Moses crosses over the Red Sea. Uh, but I was running across a passage today, and... Um, and it really, pardon me here, my microphone keeps banging on the seat and I couldn't stand that. So, just trying to relocate this. <clears throat> okay, so anyway, uh, God bless you. I am Stephen Benoon, Stephen Ben Dinoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. That's for the YouTube people that are watching. We are on live stream right now, so if you've never caught the Shabbat service live, you're able to do it. It is every Shabbat uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. in Israel, uh, 5 o'clock a lot of times in Europe, uh, different countries in Europe, around 5 o'clock, uh, I think 4 p.m. In, in Western Europe, and about 8 a.m. on California uh, uh, the coast of California out there in 9 a.m. Midwest. I guess we have to go into all that. You guys know that. Uh, but anyway, so come and join us uh, every Saturday for Shabbat Live. And uh, today we're speaking on a message called, What is Hidden in the Reeds? A uh, very interesting message the Lord revealed to my heart. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure it'll be a blessing for you guys as well. Uh, I wrote a book called Yom Suf uh, several years ago, and uh, it literally means the Sea of Reeds. It's the, it's the ocean, uh, or the waters, I should say, uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, where Moses led the children of Israel, and they crossed that body of water to escape Pharaoh and his armies. Uh, also, we know that Moses' basket by his sister was placed on the river's edge in the reeds, and Pharaoh's daughter comes out and finds that basket uh, I know we see depicted in the movies his baskets going down the river and in some cases in the cartoon like uh, the, the Prince of Egypt, the alligators are trying to get it, etc., etc. But if you look at the story, it only says that it's actually placed at the, uh, amongst the reeds at the river's edge. Uh, we don't really see a biblical uh, aspect that says it goes down the river. But none, nonetheless, it's still... I love the movies, and I, I appreciate the, um, I say the movies when I mean that, I mean as far as the biblical movie there, uh, on Moses' life, I find that very interesting, whether it be a cartoon or the actual um, movie made uh, after his, uh, the acts that God did through him. But, uh, but this actually has nothing to do with any of those. Um, I've been doing it, but, but, but ironically, I'm actually doing a study from Exodus chapter 15, where Moses comes out and he sings the song, Asher Adonai la I will sing unto the Lord, where, I, where he's gotten victory over the horse and over his rider, which we know is a future event. Uh, even the biblical commentators, the rabbinical commentators, know that this applies to in the future. And it seems to suggest that Moses would actually return. And so while I've been studying on this, and the Lord was really beginning to deal with me even more so, not just with that, but he's also dealing with me with um, the things that are happening after they cross the Red Sea crossing, even the part of uh, the, the, the water where they first go, and the water is beer at uh, Mara, and God commands him to take a tree and throw it into the water, and it turns the water sweet. And, 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 and all along, I mean, we're only talking days after the Exodus journey, the children of Israel are constantly complaining. And I'll tell you, my wife knows this as well. I can't stand complaining. You know, I think about uh, uh, early on in Jesus' ministry, and maybe this was with John when they were talking about the soldiers, and he said, be content with your wages. Uh, and I find that no matter where I am in life, be content. If you don't have the, the riches and the wealth or the fame or whatever, just be content. We don't want to find ourselves complaining 
and moaning and groaning about this or about that. We should be the happiest people on the planet Earth. We know Yeshua as the Messiah. We have something to be happy about. We, 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 we should be, I mean, you think Israel, they come across, they, they were delivered out of Egypt. They were delivered out of bondage with a mighty hand of God, seeing all these great miracles to know that they had the God of heaven leading them. And then when something didn't go their way, they're complaining about it. And that drives me nuts. I have to admit that I can't stand complaining. Um, and mainly because I think of the biblical aspect of it. I see how God reacted to it. I mean, God was, God was so angry with the children of Israel from their complaining and murmuring and bickering. And, and they think they're doing it to Moses and Aaron, right? But God says, you're doing it to me. You know, so I have just, I mean, I know things sometimes are not comfortable in life. I realize that, but I've learned to thank God and be happy uh, and praise him for everything. What may seem to be bad as well as what seems to be good. Okay, anyway, I'll get distracted and we'll never get to this message here. Uh, I'd like to take with you Matthew chapter 12, uh, the Matthew of gospel in the 12th chapter. I want to begin with the 14th verse. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. This is talking about Yeshua, talking about Jesus here. Um, they're wanting to kill him now. They're looking for a reason to kill him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and a great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known. Hmm. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, in whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall shew judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor, nor cry, neither shall any man uh, hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Now, this is where God opened my eyes to a beautiful, beautiful prophecy. Now, I want to back up to verse 20. And they, like I said, they realize that this passage is applied to Yeshua. And he says, a bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. So there does come a time then that a bruised reed, you know, he would break it. And you might think to yourself right about now, what in the world and, and, and it's funny, as many times I've read this, I've never thought about this before. What does he mean by a bruised reed? He will not break it. And obviously, if he says, and, and quite frankly, I even wonder about uh, in the smoking flag, shall he not quench? But when it says here, a bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And when I was, of course, studying in Exodus, it's another message that I'm preparing for you. This is the one the Lord revealed to me. And I'm like, this is just wild. If he's not going to break a bruised reed, then I want to know what a bruised reed is. But the thing is, is he's going to break the bruised reed. And he'll do it in judgment and in victory. Now, if I'm not mistaken, we find out that this all comes... Um, Uh, 
Oh, goodness. I actually had it written down somewhere. I believe this is from the book of Isaiah. Yes. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the prophecy that he says there is Isaiah 42. Um, just just to give you a little uh, a little background on where that's from. That should be in the margin of your Bible there. Now, so let's find out then, does the Bible tell us what a bruised reed is? It does. And that's what really got my attention. It's written in the Word of God what a bruised reed is. We find it in 2 Kings chapter 19. And before I read to you what a bruised reed actually is, I'm sorry, not chapter 19, chapter 18. Uh, let me just set the story for you a little bit about chapter 18 of 2 Kings. This, the, the whole chapter of 2 Kings is dealing with Hezekiah becoming the king of Israel. And he, like David, was very beloved of God because he was very faithful to the Lord God of Israel and he broke down the altars. He, he did away with all the high places in Israel. And, uh, and quite frankly, there was never another king like him uh, that was like David that was really a man after God's own heart. But yet at the same time, Hezekiah was dealing with the king of Assyria trying to, was threatening to take Judah. Because, of course, Hezekiah is the king of Judah. Uh, the Assyrian king had already come in and had been pounding on the house of Israel. Of course, Israel had been divided already by this time into two nations. And so he's pounding on the house of Israel, and he's very successful in what he's doing. The house of Israel is really going through a rough way. And now the king of Assyria comes down, sends messengers down to Hezekiah, and, and instead of speaking to Hezekiah, he says to them, speak to the men of the wall. But Hezekiah had already told them, don't answer them a word. And he comes in there and he boasts about how he has destroyed and stomped out every nation on the earth. And that there's no one that can help him. And he's going to do the same. Now, if you guys remember, I... I I spoke about this a little while back about Hadad. Hadad was one of Esau's descendants of the royal family. And when King David was destroying all the Edomites from Edom, which was Esau's descendants, Hadad was one of Esau's royal sons that escaped through the lineage there, that had escaped the sword of David along with some of the uh, Edomites that were the servants that also escaped and they go down into Egypt to Pharaoh and they're raised in Pharaoh's house. This is a biblical fact. Um, it is historical documentation that stands behind that as well. So it's, there's even a sec secular sources that, 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 uh, that suggest this as well, that it's not just a biblical fact. It is an archaeological fact as well. Hadad is raised in Pharaoh's house. Uh, he is given a wife uh, by, um, uh, if I remember right, that's to um, Pharaoh's, uh, what is it, his wife's daughter, something like that. I forget the exact story on that. But anyway, he marries into this family, into Egypt. And uh, eventually, though, and even has sons by the daughters of Pharaoh. So they have sons, they're, they're intermingling, just like Esau did in the beginning, intermingling with the peoples that his parents did not want him getting uh, all caught up with uh, today. Uh, and much the same, you see this, I, I bring this out because you have to remember the church, uh, the churches that came out of, uh, under the authority of Rome, they, they, they were, in the beginning, they were godly, wonderful people, but they've all slowly but surely, they've been going back to the mother, the great mother prostitute the whore of the Catholic Church. And uh, so anyway, when Hadad leaves Pharaoh, he goes, he becomes the king of uh, Damascus. He's the king of Syria. And there is documentation also, both uh, in Josephus's writings and other uh, archaeological evidence that suggest 
that finally the, uh, actually not archaeological, I'm sorry, in the book of Maccabees, it actually records that Edomea, that there was a people of Edomea that warred against the Jewish people and they were from Rome. And of course, we do know that it was after the Maccabees that Israel, because of their fears, they invite Rome down in to Israel. And the reason they invite them down into Israel is because they're scared. They, 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 they're afraid of their neighbors. And so what do they do? They invite Rome down into Israel. And then, of course, the, the Romans and the Greeks at that time, which were Esau's descendants, they turned against Israel. And the next thing you know, there, there's a huge mess. And of course, when Yeshua comes, he comes at a time when Israel is under Roman occupation. But in reality, what is Roman occupation? It's Egyptian occupa uh, occupation. Because the, uh, the Edomites, who... The one that escaped Hadad, and of course he had a whole new string of descendants. He goes to Pharaoh, raised in the courts of Pharaoh, him and his sons, marries into that, becomes the king of Syria, and they finally migrate up there, and they take all their gods and all their beliefs of Egypt with them. All right, so now they end up, they're, they're in Rome, and then of course in the book of Maccabees it talks about the Edomians warring against Israel, so it shows the children of Esau, and they're coming from uh, Greece and from uh, modern-day uh, Rome. And, and so we have, this, we have this problem here. So I, I, I just wanted to kind of set that stage for you. And then we find, though, that Hezekiah, so when Hezekiah is warring uh, or has a threat of the Syrian king, he's actually dealing with one of Hadad's descendants that is still there, uh, and of course, uh, it's just it's just a big, big, huge mess going on. But here's what happens, though: the Syrian king, when he comes down to make fun of Israel, uh, of Hezekiah and the children of Israel that are standing for the Lord God, because God had already swore, and and, and Hezekiah can consults with Isaiah the prophet, and, and and Isaiah sends word back that God would would stir a rumor up, and he would leave. And they would not fall victim to all of his threats. And uh, because Hezekiah had been praying for deliverance of that. But this is one of the things that was said in his ears that really got my attention. Verse 20. Let's go over verse 20. We'll start there. Uh, let me, I'm sorry, back up to verse 17. And the king of Assyria sent uh, Tartan and uh, Rabassus and um, and Rabshakiah from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they were come up, they came and stood by the, uh, the conduit of the upper pool, which is in the highway of the fuller's field. Interesting where it's at, isn't it? The fuller's field. And when they had called to the king, there came out of them Elakim and the son of uh, uh, Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shibana the scribe, and jo Joah, and the son of Asaph, the, the recorder. And Rabshakiah said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Thou sayest, but they are but vain words, I have counsel and strengthened for the war. Now, in whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Now, Hezekiah was not trusting on anybody else but the God of Israel. And if you think about what you're reading here, although the names seem complicated, we're dealing with the same situation in Israel today as it was back here. And the only difference is, is now this Syrian king is now in Rome. And he is an Egyptian. And the Pope of Rome is making the same boast against Israel. So he says, Thou sayest, but they are but vain words, I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt. That's what's happening with Israel. 
There's actually a passage in the Bible, and I forget exactly where it's at, but God says that you trust in the shadow of Egypt. We'll pull it up. I'm going to pull the scripture up. I think I have it marked. But we find out that Egypt is represented as a bruised reed. Now, the reason I bring this out is because Rome, the descendants of Esau, are also likened to Egypt. They're trained under Egypt. The Catholic Church's rituals and everything, the sun god, the moon god, and, and all these pagan traditions are Egyptian. Another interesting point, when Hezekiah becomes the king of, of Judah over Jerusalem, the Bible records in the 18th chapter of 2 Kings that one of the first things that he does is he breaks into pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. Imagine that. An item that God commanded Moses to make, Hezekiah breaks it into pieces. And the Bible records because the people had begun to burn incense unto this image. They had taken a thing of God and turned it into idolatry. So there again, we see, even today, in modern Catholicism, very like things. The cross on which Yeshua was on, we recognize as a blessed emblem because he died upon it. It represents torture and agony and anguish, but it also represents salvation. But the Vatican takes and puts a dead Christ on the cross and then burns incense into it. Kind of reminds you about what Hezekiah was dealing with. Now, I'm not against having a cross. I, I don't want one with Jesus being dead on it because I believe he died, was buried, and rose again. So I'm for a cross that there's no one on. But I have no desire to burn incense before the cross. I thank God for what he did for me. But I don't want to take a blessed thing and turn it into a sacrilegious thing. So it tells us that Egypt, the staff of this bruised reed. It's not all of what he says. Let's see what else he says here. Even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. Are the pieces coming together now? According to the prophecy about Yeshua, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved. In my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him. That's Isaiah 61. And he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break. When Yeshua came, he came to Israel that was under Roman occupation. Roman occupation is the same thing as Egyptian occupation. Because the Edomites of Rome were all trained under the Pharaoh of Egypt and was under high favor of Egypt. And according to this, Jesus would not break a bruised reed when he came. But later he says, till he send forth judgment unto victory. So there comes a time when Yeshua will break that bruised reed. And we find here in 2 Kings that that bruised reed 
even upon each, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. Yeshua leaned against the Roman authority. He leaned against the children of Israel that were rebellious. And when he did, that bruised reed, the Roman occupation of Israel at that time, they pierced his hands and his feet. This is why he did not break the bruised reed at that time. But judgment will come, and it is coming soon. Then he will break the bruised reed. He will break the yoke that is upon Israel's neck. And he will set them free. Um, I told you I'd read you how you can see this in Isaiah chapter 30. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, that cover with the covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. And see, this is what happens with Israel right now. Now, not all the Jews are like this. You got to remember, there's many Jews in Israel right now. You can call it a Zionist nation. There's two types of Zionism. There's one Zionism that the Vatican helped create in order to be able to get a stronghold in the land of Israel. But there's also a true Zionist Jewish people that have returned to the homeland because they're coming there to see the Messiah. These are true Zionists. These are the Zionists that God loves. This is the remnant of Israel that has returned home in order to be saved. Now, I've, I've heard a lot of uh, recently uh, in Israel, they did a, um, a consensus of the believers and they were, they were numbering them. And it was like 130 something thousand believers in Israel that, that, were, that believed Yeshua to be Messiah. And people got excited. They said, it's almost 144,000. It is wonderful to see that there's that many that are believing in the Messiah there that, had, that have admitted it. But the thing is, that's not the 144,000. The 144,000, the Bible says, when they look upon him whom they have pierced, they will weep and mourn as a family that lost their only son. This group already knows who the son is. The 144,000, they don't know who he is. See, that time has not come yet. We must put the word of God in its proper place. We cannot put the word of God over here when it has nothing to do with over there. The 144,000 that God is going to redeem who are virgins, not men. The virginity represents, they're not tied up with Rome. They're not part of the political system right now in Israel that bows to Rome's pressure. Whether it's the U.S. pressure or Rome pressure or European Union pressure, it is a group of Jews that will stand for God and His Word now and do not bow. And God says, Who, woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel but not of me, and that covereth with a covering but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. What is sin to sin? The first sin was we crucified Yeshua as Messiah. We did not recognize him, but he pardoned that sin. But if you had sin to sin, it's because you trust in Rome. You trust in Egypt, which is nothing more than a bruised reed. Do you not remember that God says that the serpent, and talking about the serpent and the woman's seed and the woman's seed, would, uh, he would bruise, uh, the Christ healed, but he would bruise his head. And that serpent has shown his face everywhere you look. He showed it in Egypt with Pharaoh. Today he shows it with the Pope of Rome. That walk to go down in Egypt and have not asked my mouth to strengthen themselves and the strength of Pharaoh to trust in the shadow of Egypt. See, Rome is the shadow of Egypt. What Hadad did the descendant of Esau, he goes into Egypt, learns all the ways of the Egyptians. Moses did as well. But the difference is, is Moses doesn't come and reflect Egypt when he comes out to deliver the children of Israel. He reflects God. 
God takes all that nonsense and gets it out of him. But all you have to do is go into any Catholic church and then look at, at Egypt and you will see a reflection. You will see a shadow being cast of all the Egyptian gods and you will see them in Rome, in the Vatican, and all other places in the world. I'll have to share with you some photos I've taken in Europe. The Pope and the sun around the Pope. and Do you not know that what is the Pharaoh of, uh, of Egypt? He says, I am the morning and I am the evening. He considers to be God on earth. The Pope of Rome considers, claims to be God on earth. And he says, Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. And that's what's causing confusion in the land of Israel today. We are being confused because the politicians have allowed the council of Egypt, the council of the Pharaoh of this world today, which is none other than the Roman Pope, Pope Francis. This is your peacemaker. Is he not the man that goes around saying, peace, peace, and there is no peace? Sure, you know, you know who he is. Sits in the temple of God, exalts himself all above that is called God, worshipped as if he were God. You know, those that try to put this on Obama, I've not seen nobody do that with him. I've not seen Obama sit in the temple of God being worshipped as if he were God. You know, I'm sure he's got his own fan club, but nothing like the Pope of Rome. I mean, you got too many people want to take with, 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 with Obama, they want to impeach him now. Pope of Rome gets more popular every day. Go to Eastern Europe, or go to Europe, period, sometime. Go to the book sh bookstores. You, if you live in Europe, you already know this. Go to the bookstores. Go to the Bible section. Do you know every Bible in there is Catholic? Every Bible that is in a bookstore in Europe is printed by the Vatican. And right alongside of all those Bibles will be book after book after book after book of Pope this, Pope that, great Pope, Pope Francis. Oh, how wonderful he is. Oh, glory, 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 glory. Your Antichrist is right under your nose and you don't even see it. That's the problem that Israel's having. That's prophesied in the Bible. And it's also prophesied that when Jesus would come, when the Messiah would come, that he would not break that bruised reed. It wasn't the time yet. It wasn't time. But judgment will come forth in victory. And we're in that time. Anyway, God bless you. I love you. We thank you for all that you do for us. Uh, please remember us as well. Uh, if the Lord lays it on your heart to help us financially, uh, we are strictly 100% ministry now. Um, we are setting things up. We are back and forth between Israel and Europe. Um, my father-in-law, he, he, Israel is just not for him. He's getting older, so we're also working with him in East, uh, Eastern Europe in his home, hometown, trying to set him up as well as we are in uh, Israel on a regular basis as well to bring news to you and updates and teachings as well to keep you up to date with the things that are going on in Israel. Uh, but we need your help. We need your support. Uh, if you choose to give, right now we have no home. Uh, we have no home in America. So we don't have an address there for you to be able to send to us there. Uh, we were not able to get the post office box set up yet, so uh, our website is a secured way of giving if you want to give there. It is returns.com. You can give there online. If you prefer to do it by mail, uh, if you can wait just a little bit longer, we will have an address for you to be able to send to. Um, and... Um, uh, I know it could be done by Western Union as well if you're more comfortable, if, you, if it's just on your heart and you want to do it now and you don't want to wait. Uh, but if not, I should have you an address here in the next couple of weeks. Um, I'll be back in Israel here in just a few days from now. 
uh, working again. Um, but we love you. We thank you. God bless you. Thank you for your prayers, your support. And um, we can't, can't thank you enough. God bless you. Let's close in prayer together this Shabbat uh, service day. And for you guys there, enjoy the rest of your Shabbat. The sun is going down here. Shabbat is ending for us, but it's still Shabbat for you. Worship him. Enjoy the day of rest that God has given you. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless your name. Baruch Shemcha. Bless your name, Father. For you are so worthy of praise and glory and honor. And we thank you, Lord, that you're so kind to open your word to us. So many beautiful treasures that are inside your word. We ask that your mercy would be upon all those that listen, Lord. And we pray, Father God, that the messages will find people wherever they may be, that it will be a blessing to them as well, to their families. I pray, Father God, that you will heal the sick among the people. Heal the sick among them, their family, their loved ones. Father God, I pray for them even now, Lord. May they believe on you, Lord. That's all it is. Believe that you have done it. May they picture in their minds and in their hearts that they have a well body. Step into that well body by faith, believing, and God will grant that unto them. We thank you, Lord, for you, for all that you do for us, Lord. And just keep us straight on your word, Father. Give us strength not to vary, not one way, or the, not right nor left, Lord, but stay, 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 stay true to your word, Lord. But we ask this, B'Shem Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. We love you guys.